and Gabriel Shaw Communications. Uh, welcome to this webinar, Planning for the Rebound. What can we learn from China? Uh, now, uh, if you're a participant, i have just ask you, I can see you all popping up there. If you could mute your audio, that would be great because that will avoid uh, too many disturbing sounds, uh, cats crossing the screen and all sorts. Uh, and then later on, if you have a question, um, you can write it in the chat and uh, we can address it. Or indeed, uh, if you have time, you can uh, unmute your microphone and pop up and uh, join us in the conversation. So, well, uh, back in the day, people used to say, you know, I heard somebody say, if you're not in the room, you're not in the know. I wrote that down on a piece of paper because I thought it was funny. My wife actually quibbled uh, on it. If you're not in the room, you're probably on Zoom. <laughs> anyway, this promises to be a lively discussion. We've got three business founders uh, in the know, bristling with insights and tools to help you create your own rebound plan. We're going to start with Felicia Schwartz. Uh, she's a Schwartz. She's got an impressive internet career in branding with countless household names. She now leads the boutique consultancy China Insights. Uh, and uh, we just got a little bit of uh, extraneous noise. So if you just joined us, if you can just mute your microphones, uh, it'll make it more comfortable uh, listening when you can join in later. So Felicia, I mean, I suppose China inevitably at the heart of this discussion for most people watching this it's a hugely important customer and it's really useful for brands to study because of course it's ahead of us in coming out of the lockdown yet of course it's facing some pretty hard questions about the virus's origins about honesty so you know that really brings us to a question now is it really premature to talk on a rebound yes nigel that's um a good question because the behavior and reaction of consumers in China right now is a bit polarized. So we hear a lot of talk and um, social media buzz around the term of revenge spending, which is a bit of a um, dramatic way of saying catch up spending and people have been spending. So they have been uh, spending on out of home um, uh, foods, going back to restaurants, going back to beauty salons. There's been a very mediatized um, descent on uh, an Hermes uh, shop in Guangzhou, which was emptied to the tune of some $7 million. And so there is a bit of that catch up um, spree. But on the other uh, side, I think what we feel is a consumer sentiment in the medium term is not that positive. So on the other extreme, uh, we hear terms like duan shili, which is Chinese for um, cutting down on, on non-essential spending. And I think that prolongs also a movement that we already saw before this crisis, which is a Chinese consumer that's much more conscientious, that is especially young consumers that are looking at uh, luxury a bit differently, really looking at brands and separating, not, no longer this really conspicuous consumption. Then they also see what has happened in the world and they see a picture that's not that positive. We don't know when this will end. A lot of countries are still, which are clients of China um, or involved somehow in, in, in the process are not in a good place and they're also worried looking at that. So the sentiment on one hand, yes, some spree, some, um, some big consumption coming back in beauty and out of home. On the other hand, we, we feel a sense that consumption is going to be more restrained and consumer sentiment not that positive. So, Renee, it's quite clear that uh, the Chinese are not flocking back to the malls yet. And everywhere in the world, we got this uh, issue, and it was one that was being considered today as to uh, what the nature of the uh, social distancing will be long into the future. Uh, we've lost the ability to, to touch. You know, we, we, we miss our relations. We can't give them a hug. They're not in the, they don't live with us. And uh, that has profound implications, doesn't it, for luxury brands i mean most of us aren't dressing up anymore um we're not wearing makeup um everything is different about how we consume and actually what we need yeah i think that's true and i think um you know china is a great area for us to look at and see how you know as the country is kind of rebounding right now um it is you know people are back to work they're back to the malls they're back to restaurants so although you know it's not as um in force as it was you know, we've seen a bit of a flight to quality. So the best malls are doing um, are doing better than the, the sort of average malls. 
Um, we're seeing large brands are getting more um, pickup from, from consumers and maybe more of the mid medium size. So we are seeing when people do spend, it tends to be um, the hot, the biggest, um, the Hermes. You know, I just had a friend that was just in a Shake Shack in Shanghai yesterday and you couldn't even get a seat. It was so crowded. So people are back. Um, and I think China doesn't always give us, it. not everything that happens in China is transferable outside of China, but right now it's really the only model we have of a country that has gone through you know, a pretty severe crisis and has come out of it on the other end. And so I think there's you know, a lot of things we can learn for luxury brands, for beauty brands, um, everything down to you know, the way that you enter a mall. Um, right now, you, know, you go through thermal imaging, you're showing a QR code, um, you know, things have changed in the way the retail environment is. Um, we were just having a call with a beauty brand the other day and just talking about what's it going to be like when you're in retail and are you ever going to touch a tester again? Are you going to want to have someone do your makeup? You know, how is your experience going to change? Mm -hmm. um, and we are seeing a lot, you know, Ali, Alipay and more of the technical solutions where there's really, um, China had always had a really big offline to online connection, much bigger than anywhere else in the world. And we think this is going to accelerate that even more. So, you know, can you, can you use a mobile app or, what, or WeChat to be shopping before you get to the store, even do some personalization, pay before you get there, and just go in and pick up your goods and not really spend a lot of time in retail. So the way people are interacting in retail um, is gonna fundamentally change after this, and this is gonna be global. Um, same thing with travel. You know, We're seeing examples of airlines trying to take the middle seat out, and how are they gonna configure your seating so you can be six feet away from people? We've well, actually had Ryan there say that they won't do it. I mean, they may well. Oh, really? yeah. they may that may does matter. He says he won't fly. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to ask you about um, what what sort of your take is on the way the different brands in China have responded to this, which of course does involve a lot more digital contact with consumers to make up for what they can't do face to face. Yeah, I, I think China was a really great example of how brands um, innovated during the during the crisis. Um, so one of the things we really saw was a huge. Um, online kind of uh, social selling, if you will, right? So you have um, store staff that are home and not unlike what you're seeing in most of the retail um, locations around the world, you're still paying your store staff, they're home, um, they're connecting with people from home. So we've had you know, great uh, examples of people doing a lot of live streaming. You might have a beauty ambassador doing a makeup tutorial when his cats are kind of crawling on him or going in the background. So you know, you're seeing a lot of people really innovate. They created WeChat groups, they did um, some really, interesting kind of the first 10 people to message me get this when they did promotions instead of going um, across the board they were very selective and use this as an opportunity to really connect with the consumer so whether that's just providing them advice whether that's just being there for them creating these touch points that are not just from your corporate touch points but how do you use all of your staff to really create this personal connection and mm -hmm. use this time to develop okay. I'm, I'm going to bring Gabrielle in just a second but just before we do that Felicia just give us your take on how brands have been playing into this? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that came to my mind when Rene was just speaking uh, right now was the Shanghai Fashion Show, which uh, in fact happened through this uh, period and was the first global online fashion show. And that was really interesting to see because you saw how um, online technology was used in two senses. One was uh, to have the see it, see it, buy it now uh, kind of capacity that you can have online. So you see a fashion show, a catwalk, and you can click through and buy it right now. So that's one uh, part of it. But actually, interestingly enough, uh, some brands, especially young brands, use this not in order to sell, 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 but to really create a brand story. And I think that's another point uh, Renee just touched on, that people really need that. They want to know the brand story, um, the brand purpose, and a couple of, of young uh, Chinese street brands, etc., they brought their fashion creators online, who created, who, who told about, who told the crowds about uh, online crowds, of course, about their inspiration. So there was a lot of that as well, and that was very interesting to see. And we can, see, and I'm sure that will be um, uh, maybe a trend uh, going further because the fashion industry is asking itself a lot of questions now about sustainability and flying people across the world for shows and sourcing, et cetera. And one thing I just add real quick before we move to the next subject, um, you know, I think I saw a quote from Scott Galloway the other day that seemed very, um, I think, uh, prescient right now, which was more of, um, you know, the crisis is not necessarily gonna change everything, but it's really gonna accelerate all the changes that were gonna happen before. Yeah. yeah. I think if you look at the retail environment, brand environment, China has always, from a digital standpoint, 
been very advanced. Um, and I think what you're seeing is you're seeing an acceleration in China and now the rest of the world can look to that as a way to say, as we accelerate our digital transformation around the world, you know, here's a model for how that's happened and how do we adapt that for different countries around the world. Okay, we're going to talk about sustainability a little bit later, but um, just uh, picking up on this, uh, uh, Gabrielle Shaw, this idea that um, uh, brands have to uh, speak directly to consumers digitally and change how they do everything. What I mean, are you aware of many conversations going on about all this or, or, or a, a lot of companies just at the stage where they're just sort of throwing advertising together? They're really not sure where all this is going. I mean, I think that's a great question, Nigel. I think everybody is aware that they need to do something different. I think there's probably about, with some research out the other day, about 12% of brands aren't changing the way they're communicating. Um, and I think they will lose out for, for having decided not to do so. Um, but it's, it's incredibly important that brands take this opportunity. And I know we're going to talk a little bit later about preparing for the rebounds, but how they, how they use this time and brands will be judged on how they respond and how they communicate with their, their customers right now. Um, ones that are able to um, be hopeful and empathetic and um, really get the tone right right now in terms of thinking about what's important to their audiences and using the time to spend that time to understand their audiences better, um, how they are feeling about this, this period of time and, and what's going to be important to them when they start coming out of it. Gabriel, let, let me ask you this and then put it to uh, both Felicia and Renee. Um, the, the big political story, of course, about China is not so much yet about how China is recovering or how consumers are feeling. It's about suspicion about whether China's told uh, the truth about what's uh, gone on and uh, there's all kinds of questions about future boycotts and of course these work both ways. We saw when the Chinese boycotted Apple uh, products from the US. So what is your sense of um, how brands are going to have to be aware of that bigger picture, the concern about China among some people and of course being stoked by the US president maybe? That's a that's a big question, Nigel. <laughs> I'd say that I, I would say one piece about this that I think has been a very good thing that's come out of this period is people knowing there needs to be um, a, a virus like the coronavirus doesn't know any borders, and so we globally have to be collaborating and and working together to be able to navigate through this period. But it also raises questions in terms of sustainability and supply chain and how. Countries need to be also more, on the one hand, thinking globally as a, as a world, global community. On the other hand, how have we got ourselves into a situation that we're relying on um, lots of other countries for some of the basic things? That I suppose what, what I'm asking here is, would Chinese consumers, I'll, I'll put this to the others as well, mm -hmm. will they blame brands because they're in Europe, in China, in the US? In other words, how political are uh, the goods and services, luxury goods and services that we use? I think that there, I think, I think we should all answer this question, but I think people care a lot about the values of the brands and the integrity of the brands that, that they are buying. Um, people do have the power to um, reward brands who do well and, 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 and are doing the right thing right now. I, I think some of, the, some of the other political issues will probably come into that too. Um, but I think brands are ever more under scrutiny right now for how they're communicating during this period. And, and I think that, that that will become an issue. Uh, uh, and thank you for that. You might uh, want to answer that too. Right. I don't know which of you wants to pick up on this, but um, it does mean that the signals, the communications coming from uh, companies is quite important now because they are actually positioning themselves for this new normal everybody keeps talking about, even though we don't know whether there is a, a, a clear pattern. Yeah. Well, I think um, as Renee pointed out before, a lot of what's happening now is sort of just um, making current trends even bigger and, and um, sort of magnifying them. And first of all, in China, politics and the economy are always tightly um, connected and there have been backlashes in the past against foreign brands, often American brands, because they symbolize the West somehow, in periods of heightened tension. But I think what's going on now is a lot, what we saw even before the crisis, that Chinese brands are just growing 
and uh, because of the economy, because they understand the consumer better, because especially in some uh, categories like beauty or fashion, there is some uh, sense in actually knowing uh, the preferences and the specificity of uh, Chinese skin, Chinese size, etc. But um, during the coronavirus, yes, there has been a lot of messaging. Um, mind you, in the beginning, China was the only country in the situation. There has been a lot of nationalistic messaging from the Chinese government, a lot of go China, we're going to get out of here, uh, out of this situation, rather. And um, a lot of consumers reacted in, yes, I'm going to support Chinese brands. I want Chinese brands to make it out of this uh, situation. So it has heightened a buy China um, movement that already started before. And we see that in beauty with uh, C beauty now coming up. We always talked about K beauty and Japanese J beauty, but now Chinese beauty, C beauty is really something that's coming up. So definitely China and Chinese brands are coming more and more on the map. Is there going to be a long-term rejection of uh, Western brands? I don't think so. But there's going to be more competition and more local buying. And, and one thing I think to add on that, you know, I think that international brands need to be really, really careful with this issue. Um, there was a scandal this week already with Lululemon um, where one of their um, designers had made an offensive t-shirt, not through Lululemon, but through, I think, like a side business he had. And people in China found out about it, and there was massive uproar against it, and they, they fired him already. Um, very quickly, they issued a release, um, they fired him quickly, and they're still dealing with the scandal right now. So I think that brands need to be extremely careful with this, um, and to look at it across borders, too. So it's something that's not just happening in China, but it's happening all over the place. Um, you know, people, you know, of Asian descent are getting discriminated against already today in many different countries. Um, so it's something that brands really need to be careful of. And I think when the consumer starts traveling again, when we start seeing Chinese tourists again, um, we're going to need to look out for a backlash against it as well. Um, you mentioned travel there. Uh, Gabrielle, I know you were telling me the Kuoni uh, adverts were quite interesting here. I think that was actually um, a, a Felicia who was saying that. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Felicia, uh, Kiloni, travel company, we can't travel. I mean, that's the ultimate problem, really, isn't it? Uh, sorry, you're talking about the travel impact. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I'm we, I think we were talking about Kiloni and how they were pitching. Oh, yes. When, yes. when in fact, there is no travel that's possible. I keep getting emails that I delete from Jet2. Yes. No, that's, I think that's interesting. And that brings us to the point of for brands of being really flexible in a time where we don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know if there's going to be a second outbreak, things going back and forth. It looks quite optimistic one day, then it looks less so. And it feels like we're going towards a period of just the unknown, really. Is it going to go, you know? And uh, some brands are showing great flexibility. And the example that I mentioned with Crony was, I think it was about a month ago, where they came out with a travel campaign selling these very enticing packages uh, because people, of course, are still dreaming of travel and is dreaming even more of getting away, but these packages were flexible. So you buy it now and you can cancel um, a week before or days before the travel. So absolute flexibility in terms of paying them. So it's a really great understanding of consumer psychology. Yes, I still want to travel, of course, but my concern is things being um, cancelled, etc. So how can brands cater to that, to the reality of the consumer? Before we talk in detail about making a plan, um, Gabrielle, I've got a note here about BT's new campaign. This is, of course, the, uh, the main uh, telephone uh, broadband operator in the UK, and they've kind of uh, broken a lot of the rules. They're kind of doing the opposite, uh, uh, basically demonstrating their purpose through communicating um, sort of telling people how to use digital skills, you know, I don't know, people in care homes, how to, to get on and talk to their families. Um, I've also seen, for example, Bird's Eye, it's a big frozen food company. They had an ad that's got lots of nurses, lots of stills, uh, families in situations. Um, this is all very laudable and it really taps into a mood, but that particular mood can change quite quickly. It doesn't seem to me to be a a permanent solution to how they're going to go forward. It's just a kind of interim one. And I just wonder, does this come from, is it the communication people going back to the company and saying, you've got to change? I mean, 
how does this conversation take place when things are changing so quickly? I mean, I think in terms of how brands are adapting to this situation, every brand is different depending on what the services they're offering. I'd like to think all brands are looking at how they can be part of a solution right now so they can be thinking about what service they supply and how can they help in some way. And I think from a communications perspective, look at us now, we're all on Zoom. Um, you know, broadband is, is certainly powering my life to a great degree right now, allowing me to do workshops like this online to be able to communicate with my clients and also, and, and friends and family. Um, and I think there's a huge element when we talk about being able to connect with others right now. Mental health is one of the big, biggest concerns that's going to come out of this um, COVID-19 situation. You know, there's, there's, there's so many things that people need to be thinking about, keeping their businesses afloat, um, making sure that their children can continue to be educated, making sure that um, they're connected if they're isolated with, with friends and family and being able to be part of that um, solution and we take it for granted. You know, my tech skills, I would say, have um, they are not fantastic, but they are much better since this has started. I have to be much more adept. Um, and I would say, for a lot of people, we've been involved in another campaign called um, Get Connected, which we've helped on a pro bono basis. It's it's exactly that about getting um, getting the older communities to be able to understand how to use digital skills, how to set up Zoom, how to download apps. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you think that comes naturally to digital natives, but it doesn't to a lot of people. They don't even very simple things. They're just, if you're not used to doing them. So I think the brand's role in that, I, I think that's a good thing if they're helping that. Is that what people are gonna need necessarily long-term? I think a lot of people are thinking quite short-term or near-term of how am I feeling now? You know, there's a concern, we're at six weeks of this lockdown now in the UK. And that's a long time to be on your own. So those things are very important. Now, other things will also be important. And I think what I hope to see is that brands are doing what they can in this time, making it part of their conversations. And that can be using their services to help. You know, some people have been, you know, we have a huge issue right now with protective um, PPE for, for hospital workers and care workers. You know, if they can help that way, that's fantastic. But if they can help educate um, or uplift, you know, it's what can a brand do that's true to themselves about and it doesn't have to be what they're what they're selling but what can they be part of what and and sometimes it's just amplifying a you know a psa you know stay in stay at home message but in other times it's it's how do you inspire how do you uh, entertain them during difficult times how do you make sure their their children are are have, have meaningful things to do as best possible or, or can get their school education right now yeah. Uh, Renee, I'm, I'm sure it's the same in China. We've all at least loved the fact that the traffic is very low, the air is better. We've had a bit of a sense of what life would be like uh, without uh, uh, so much pollution and all that. Uh, but at the same time, in terms of using that to plan, there is also a danger, isn't there, that we kind of project onto the future, a kind of golden age when we'll all be working from home in a very civilized fashion. I mean, the reality is it's gonna be messy, isn't it? I, I don't know if that's what's been, been happening in China too. I mean, I, I had heard it said that uh, people felt that COVID-19 was some kind of sort of you know, punishment from the almighty or whatever the Chinese believe in. And that um, you know, we, we do have this opportunity to make the world better, but it might be a danger for brands if they assume that the, the new world is gonna be you know, all sweetness and light. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really important for brands now is they have to really stay on top of the consumer sentiment because I think one thing we're seeing is it's changing so fast. So even, you know, we've been tracking consumer sentiment out of China and even two weeks after the lockdown, things were drastically different. Every two weeks, there's dramatic changes in the way people are, are perceiving things and time just seems to be, everything's changing so quickly. So I think brands need to really be aware of that. And in the short term, when they don't know what's going to happen, it's still very hard to predict. Um, to really focus on these enduring qualities that are things that are not going to change. So in this period right now, you know, focusing on longevity, focusing on community, you know, um, I think brands that have been able to step in to help with PPE and retool their factories, or, you know, have we seen, um, you know, people making hand sanitizer and giving out for free, you know, those types of um, activities, ways that they're, they're donating back to the community, getting involved are really important messages for consumers right now, because they want to feel part of um, you know, the same community. I think in China, um, similar to what I think Gabrielle was talking about, um, there was a, a project in China called Goodnight Hubei, 
um, during the outbreak. And that was basically what they did is um, because the, the outbreak was so bad in Hubei, um, they had people who both celebrities and regular people would send a good night text message to di different people in Hubei every night and they matched them up. And it was this feeling of we're in this together, we're here for you, we're connected. And it's this daily reminder of that. So I think those are some examples. And I think, you know, another one that I saw that was quite good was um, Guinness um, has been doing a great series of ads that have come out and videos that have come out since then. Um, you know, during, they came out right around um, St. Patrick's Day. So St. Patrick's Day, of course, their advertising campaigns are very much typically focused on partying and celebrating. And they had to switch really quickly. And they they really put a message of, we're in this for the long haul. We're here, you know, they, they mentioned, you know, we've signed a 9,000 year lease on our factory. We're here for the long term. We're here for the workers. We're here for the pub owners. We're here for the restaurant community. And to have that message, you know, and it was kind of a, we will, you know, we'll be able to drink together again. We're cheersing from, from Zoom. You know, those types of things and, and messages that meet the moment and can connect with people on in a more of an emotional and enduring quality is something that it's good to do right now. And, you know, of course, the future is going to change. And at some point, we're going to need to do more action oriented and more buy now. But right now, it's more of a comforting message, I think, for people in that, that personal connection. So Felicia, do you agree we're still at that comfort stage? Um, yeah, I think we're transitioning um, throughout stages, but I agree both with Gabriel uh, and with Renee. We are, I think, uh, consumer behavior is looming really large now because this um, COVID-19 has been a health crisis and uh, a mental health crisis, and it's, it really traumatized the consumer. It's created a huge interruption. So, um, yes, we are the readjustment stage now where brands still need to comfort people. I think what's coming out uh, in, in the future, if we look at well, what are the, beyond what's going on now and anxieties, et cetera, what is coming out of this in terms of consumer sentiment? And I think we chatted about this the other day. I feel that consumers are getting much more holistic in their attitudes toward consumption and also what they want out of brands. So once again, if we look at areas like beauty, people don't just want to look good, they want to feel good, that's very clear. And we saw that during the crisis, um, I think also Renee talked about it, a lot of the brands went throughout these different, they crossed these different boundaries. So fitness brands put on meditation and beauty brands like InnoHerb put a whole um, um, video program out there which incorporated yoga and beauty and all sorts of routines that you can do to relax. So beauty became a place not just for making up, although people experimented a lot during this time um, with tutorials, but also a space for relaxation and connecting with oneself. And um, so that holistic attitude I think is going forward. And also in terms of what people expect from brands. So they expect from brands to be authentic, to have a true story, to have a true purpose, and especially in China to be extremely transparent. And so this whole supply chain, where do you get um, your stuff from? Um, how green are you? How sustainable are you? So all of that is going to be very important going all, forward. All of that, Renee, involves a certain degree of transparency, doesn't it? And I just wonder when luxury brands have to kind of sort of get close to their consumers there is always this risk that they they can't be as exclusive as they used to be because they have to share everybody's problems I mean it's the age-old problem with luxury is you want to, you want to sell to as many people without losing the exclusivity and the two are, are um, well not mutually exclusive yeah no I think that's true and I think that this is that time when you can build those personal connections and they and they need to you know you don't want to look cold and you don't want to look like you're just business as usual during this time so I think there need to be ways to connect with people and I think you know some of the luxury houses I think have been pretty quick in stepping up with community give back um, so I think that's a, a great example of how the luxury brands have really gotten involved and I think the other thing is um, which is I think always a, a struggle for luxury brands is you know what's happening right now is there's a huge um, a huge tendency to discount right especially when the department stores and the retailers are really hurting right now so you're seeing the department stores are already going on fairly deep discounts and you're seeing some brands start to play the discounting game even get brands that don't typically do this so you know how brands can kind of take this and stay true to their their um, the brand heritage and the way that they've normally marketed but adapt to a new situation can be challenging you don't want to seem callous um, even though it's something you don't usually do as a brand so I think it really takes some thoughtful um, approaches to what's what's inherent with your brand image and your brand um, values and how you can kind of connect with with people without losing what you stand for normally and this is a time when 
I think brands have to try new things. You know, we saw uh, Louis Vuitton did a the first ever live stream on Little Red Book in China, and that's very different for them. They would have never done anything like that before. What, what is Little Red Book? Little Red Book. Uh, yeah, Little Red Book is it's kind of a um, shopping forum, if you will, shopping and brand forum in China. It's hugely, hugely popular, and people share all types of information, and um, brands can have a presence on it, um, and they can also post things. And after Louis Vuitton did that, you know, what was great about it is they were trying new things, and they are connected with the consumer, but you did hear consumers saying, well, that didn't feel very luxury. Um, I'm not sure if that's what a luxury brand should be doing. Maybe it didn't look good enough. So how you keep this glossy veneer, which is what luxury brands are usually for, and then how do you bring that today when you're in a Zoom call or maybe you're in somebody's house and how you do these things and change them, um, you know, it can speak really big volumes about the brand. I'm not sure Gabrielle's clients would like uh, their products described as having glossy veneer, but <laughs> Gabrielle, you, you've had a lot of these conversations with brand owners, with companies, you help them with sustainability initiatives, you help them um, try and communicate uh, what they're doing with wellness. Talk about your experience sort of so far and whether that would actually help going forward. And I wanted to just add one point on to, on to the conversation Renee was, Renee was answering. Um, I think there's this, there is this juxtaposition of luxury brands who spent years, um, you know, when we're working on brands, it's about having a very, very tight vision for your brand and making sure everything is executed to a fantastic uh, level. But I also think there's an opportunity right now for brands to be more human, and it doesn't mean they're less luxury, uh, and a huge opportunity for founders. We work with a lot of, um, of, of entrepreneurs who actually are the faces of their brand, and not every brand is, is set up that way. But being able to have that realness and have that empathy and and i think it, it 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 is it is something in these situations that that actually brings um your customers closer and this is an opportunity in certain ways to behave in ways that you haven't before seeing the way brands are doing fashion shoots you know using model you know using family members or or it, it, to do to, to to do um to do a photo shoot things you would never have seen brands do. and i think people are actually, really just, just tell me about that because you mentioned this example to me the other day of somebody who used a uh uh, his daughter to advertise. Tell me about that. So my next door neighbor, <laughs> they, they have a brand called Oliver Spencer and um, he used his daughter to do photography on their roof. Um, and modeling menswear. You know, it was not what you would expect, but it was just, it was just a more human connection that we're in this together. This is not how it used to be. Um, but we're just, Still here, and we're thinking of support for brands who are innovating. They want them to succeed through this period. There is a, you know, we were talking a little bit about supporting Chinese brands and that and that um, support for them there. Here in 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 Britain, people want it to, to to they want brands to be able to get navigate through this period, and they know there'll be a lot less of the things they normally used to do. And, and, and I think people are well, interested in the, how they're the doing What about the very big traps? I mean, Victoria Beckham, for example, furloughing that is, getting government 80% support for her staff um, out of the taxpayer in Britain, when, of course, she uh, has a squillions uh, of her own wealth. And Richard Branson's been in the same situation. Is this, a, I mean, is this something brands have to think about? I think brands need to really think about their tone of voice. Um, and they need to think about um, how people that may have supported them for years will be feeling now. What are, what are things that are most, you know, people should use this time to think about what's most important. How does this it, happen? It is, is it that they don't talk to their communications people? Because I wouldn't mind betting if you had that account, you, you would have told, you would have headed that off at the past, wouldn't you? Or at least you'd have given, you'd have said, look, you've got to think about it. I mean, those are those are tough conversations to have with clients, but we do have them and they're not the easiest clients, but to be, you know, we, we tell it like it is. And we always have to say whether it's issues that come up about, you know, UK brands paying taxes or not. Um, those are the sorts of things that supply chain. I mean, brands have to be much more transparent right now. They have to be open to those questions. Um, that would not be a very, you know, it, it, these, there, there's just been so many cases of brands that shouldn't be furloughing. And we're seeing some interesting examples now with some of the, the sport teams, football teams who are 
some of them are trying to furlough people. Others are saying, you know, then some of the, the sports organizations are pushing back and say, well, you're not going to actually be able to do transfers or you will be limited further on down the line. But other ones then are saying, can you, you can use our stadium to make a, a hospital or um, especially once there was one doing one recently for um, pregnant, you know, it was a antenatal care facility they were creating equally. Um, they have to be thinking about about the bigger picture, you know, what the furloughing system was was set up for. Okay, um, we're, that's great. We're going to move on to your questions. So if you'd like to start sending any questions that uh, you'd like uh, our, uh, our guests to address, then please uh, put them in the chat uh, straight away and we'll have a look at those. Um, we're going to move on now to talking about how you bring all this together, how you make a plan. I'll go back to Gabrielle in just a second on that. But uh, Felicia, you look at lots of data and all this. Firstly, if you're sitting down, uh, maybe as a communications person, with the, uh, the, the people who own the brand, the business, the people who want to sort of think about the future, what sort of information should you start bringing into this conversation? What sort of cultural or other data is going to be useful to you? Well, I think um, if we're talking about, I don't know if we're talking now globally about China, but it really depends also on the uh, category that you're in. So I think, you know, beauty is coming back uh, more quickly perhaps than other categories. So it's more about what are the products that are going to, sell, to be selling more now? Uh, what are the messages to drive through more now? And other categories will take some more time. So I think it's not the same picture for every category, really. And Renee, um, does this mean you might be pulling together a different team to the sort of people who normally talk about future business? I, th I mean, I think what, what brands are doing that's interesting is some of the partnerships they're having during this time. So you know, we saw um, did some really great things. They partnered with um, a very popular Instagram influencer, and they were basically putting out positive messages and messages of support. They put out on billboards. They're using their ad dollars instead of promoting. And there's no, no mention of coach in the ad. There's no mention of their products. There's no pictures of their products. They're just messages of support. Um, and we saw Bottega Veneta has been doing an artist residency where they're trying to promote different artists. They're creating Spotify lists, they're you know giving back to the artist community. So I think this is an opportunity for brands to, maybe it's not everything they're doing, maybe it's just more about how they're empowering others and are they supporting small businesses, are they supporting artists, are they supporting their workers? And I think you know what, you know, picking up on what Gabrielle was just talking about, um, you know, we've seen things like Disney just furloughed 100,000 people while their executives got big bonuses, and that doesn't sit well with consumers, right? And Shake Shack just gave back um, $10 million that they had gotten from a government loan because they figured, you know, maybe we're a big company and we shouldn't be taking small business monies. So I think consumers are going to be judging these decisions that businesses make and the way that they're responding, and it is an opportunity for innovation. And maybe it's an opportunity to look to your community. It doesn't need to be something all the time that the brand does, and it's an opportunity to do some things that are a little bit outside the box, but can really resonate and, and meet the moment um, and what consumers really need right now. Okay, so Gabrielle, talk a bit more about how you can make a plan and start bringing these things together. I think it's a really good time for Britain. And, and some people are seeing this as a pause point, whether it's businesses, and, and, and it's a combination between, we now know a little bit more about what's, what's going on. We don't know what the medium term is going to hold for us, but we know things are different. So I th the first piece is, you know, we've acknowledged where we are and things are very different. And I think people have been doing their tactical things that they've had to do now in terms of some of the immediate support their, 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 or communities they're targeting. But now is an amazing time to, to use that period of a pause where brands don't normally have the time that where they really have the ability to focus a little bit more on how are they going to behave in the future? You know, so we are finding we're doing a lot of brand workshops where companies want to make sure they're getting it right. So when, th and we don't know that things are going to be better soon. They probably won't be, but they know, we know they're going to be different. So how do you make sure your brand is as, as resonant as possible in these times? How are you setting up and thinking about things that are really about, first of all, starting with making sure you've got very strong values and vision reevaluate, taking a look, are they still what we set up to do? Are we still delivering on that promise? And a lot of these other questions come out of that. You know, if you're really clear about who you are as a brand, you probably are not going to do some of the things some of these brands have done where they've really misstepped in these times and they, they haven't been thinking about um, their relationship with the public or how they should appear right now and, and how they should be doing the right thing. So it's getting your brand house in order, making sure that you use this time well and then thinking about what are the things that you can do, you know, to, to um, Renee's point on collaboration, 
collaboration is an incredibly uh, cost-effective and generous way for brands to behave. It, it allows them to go into a territory. That's one of our key things we're advising people to do right now, to go into territory they maybe don't always do, you know, whether it's collaborating with the arts, it's using third-party spokespeople that can very powerfully speak about your brand and speak about and, and real fans um, and can take you into sort of new territory. And it's, it's, that can be, if it's done really well, ways to uplift communities that need that support as well as, as um, being creative with, with, with um, who you're talking to, somebody who's just walked in the room, my apologies. Um, and uh, those, those sorts of things are, are incredibly important. Um, the, sorry, I've slightly gotten distracted here. People are <laughs> walking in the room. <laughs> pitfalls of having a webinar my very kind husband is bringing me a cup of tea um anyway to go back to that you know with with collaborations it's it's also thinking right now about um how can you reach new audiences and that's an incredibly important you need to communicate to your own audiences but looking at tactics like collaborations allows you to go and reach a newer audience and a wider one and that's incredibly important for brands right now and also you know whether you're supporting supporting smaller businesses or you're supporting the arts um that mutuality there about you we can help each other and i think people love the idea of innovation that's come out of this space but also creativity you know seeing a brand do something you would never expect them to do um and having somebody talk about your brand um in a really generous way in a way that you can't yourself is is is, is, is a pretty powerful thing to do and some of the things we think is, are, are really important about that is, is, is how do you also make sure um, you're thinking about what's going to be important to people a little bit later on. I know people are thinking that, that sustainability is incredibly important. They're thinking the planet is in unprecedented territory and, and if we don't make huge changes, um, we're going to find ourselves in very, very bad situation. I think people right this moment, you know, you're cleaning your houses with cleaning fluid and, you know, there's, there's definitely a, um, a duality to how we're behaving and how we're thinking about the planet. There's been so much progress there, but very soon that will be important to brands, even if it costs them more, I think, in, in doing the right thing and continuing to be protecting the planet um, because it's been under so much strain. So those are, that's an area where we're really finding brands also can use this time to be thinking about how they, they start tackling some of those issues. Uh, well, so far our participants seem struck dumb by your wisdom, but hopefully some uh, questions will come out. So do ask us a question, or maybe just give us a bit of a sense of your own experience of this process of uh, rethinking uh, your communications, what your company does. Uh, is it easy to get people together? Uh, who's actually leading those conversations? Um, Felicia and Renee, that is a question, isn't it, sometimes, that um, uh, clearly in, uh, in the old world, back in the day, uh, the brand owners would come up with products, the uh, marketers and the communications people would uh, uh, get the public excited about them. Now, it so depends on reading the mood, doesn't it? It may well be you just, you've got the wrong suite of products. Renee. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, taking that kind of really um, key pulse, you know, kind of, you know, your finger on the pulse of what's happening with consumers. So I think, you know, you've seen, um, you know, things like Netflix had um, their, their Netflix party, right, which is mm -hmm. something that nobody really thought about before. And now all of a sudden, there's this need to watch movies together in different locations, which is not something that was really a big issue before. But now there, there might be these niche products that you had that you were, um, you know, had kind of uh, incubating before, but this is the time where it really meets the moment of what the consumers want. I know Tencent, um, you know, the, the company in China, they saw certain products went really up during the time of the, of the outbreak. Um, one of them was Tencent Meeting, right, which is very similar to Zoom. So this is a product that was not really big for them, wasn't a huge, um, you know, huge component of their portfolio. Now it's, now it's hugely important. So I think we're seeing, um, you know, we're also seeing uh, more of the technology integration where people are trying to figure out you know, how do I make this easier for the consumer? And I think um, some of the retailers have done a great job of completely redoing their website very quickly so that it's more um, like Target, for instance, one of these, you know, you don't usually shop on Target that much from an e-commerce standpoint, but now the whole thing is that way. So during Easter, they had, you know, basket fillers, you know, gifts for your kids, you know, edible things. So they basically were trying to look at how is this consumer shopping in a new way and how can I change my product? And even everything as simple as the technology that you're using and the way that you're bundling it and telling a story and driving people through that experience from a digital standpoint is something very new for some of these retailers. Yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, Renee that part of the issue has been providing, not just providing new things for this situation, but providing 
consumers with the same kind of services and how to maintain certain connections. And uh, just thinking about retail, which Rene talked about, I mean, in China, uh, a few malls, notably one in Shanghai, put in place a virtual reality. So you could still sort of have like the experience of um, browsing a mall, but through technology. And just to go back to Louis Vuitton, uh, Chinese consumers really need this feeling of exclusivity and exchange. And so one of the things uh, Louis Vuitton did, that they did um, these WeChat uh, pop-ups actually so that maintains exclusivity and when you do it on wechat which is you know by invitation um forum you maintain that feeling that you are sort of like one of the the few uh, chosen ones you access something that's quite uh, exclusive the other thing and maybe that's quite china focused or china specific as well is that chinese consumers need relationship and that's part of what makes them feel also very valued and uh, once again, Louis Vuitton made it possible for people to keep chatting to uh, sales assistants. So this, this whole infrastructure now, now by technology where you can liaise or stay in touch with sales assistants and they let you know when there's something new in the shop and they talk to you about it. So that relationship aspect of uh, luxury, which is very important, um, is maintained thanks to technology. Gabriel, this does seem to be, I mean, judging by the way that people treat me in shops, clearly I don't go to enough uh, uh, high-end uh, businesses and I'm sure I would get better service, but that is a really, it's, it's just a totally different world for many companies to have to think about very quickly, isn't it? To just entirely change the way that they interface with their audience. I think it's quite a big opportunity too, though. I think it is the opportunity to be much more personal. Um, Sometimes in, in certain instances, it's, it's, it gives you the ability to talk about things you've never talked about with your, um, with your consumer. Uh, you know, we've got a, a project we're working on right now, and it's, it's, it's a, a wellness brand, but they're talking to Gen Z teens um, in terms of how they're feeling in, in, in times of, of COVID-19. And it's been fascinating in terms of, you know, they're, they're, they're a skincare brand. Um, and for them, they're talking about you know they're they're using their community to actually write diaries they've called some created something called the corona diaries and it's been fantastic how these children are talking about how it means what it, what it means for them that they're not going to get to graduate from high school as they thought and all sorts of misses they're going to have in terms of milestones in their lives and um that's an unusual friend a thing for a brand to do to get people to take photos of themselves in their homes and talk about how they're feeling you know that's real connection there and well, you, you mentioned the mental health uh, issue earlier. I, I must say, obviously, if we, we turn on our televisions, the focus every night, inevitably and rightly, is on, uh, on the loss of life, on the impact on elderly people, the care homes, the PPE. But I do was sparing the thought for um, people of rising age, people who right now, uh, never mind sitting exams, will be trying to get jobs and will be uh, denied that ability to, to make contact with people and certainly... Uh, uh, as you were saying, there are many other aspects uh, to it, and dating and all that, everything, everything. I mean, there people who, being stuck at home, has so many profound effects on, on people of all ages and not not just the elderly. Um, I guess that's probably the case in, in China too, uh, Felicia, with many single households, of course. Um, yeah, so people have been, uh, they are, uh, there's an increasing percentage of single households. I mean, people are much more on um, social media, and that's quite known. So WeChat, also, um, so the short video platforms have been really booming through this time. So people have ex been exchanging on Douyin, which is the Chinese uh, TikTok and similar platforms. So a lot of humor about the situation. And in fact, these short uh, video platforms have been booming because of that. So it started with exchanging news and then exchanging um, comical sort of um, videos about what people do during this situation and sort of creating a little bit of lightness. Um, mm. So once again, social media has been really huge in that. And, um, and other things um, also enabled by technology like uh, groups forming on WeChat of neighbors, um, shopping together, um, providing each other help and mainly forming these groups to shop for, for things together. Um, all sorts of networks like that, really enabled by social media. 
Yes, there's a there's neighbours chat where where I, where I live, and I find eighty percent of it is incredibly helpful and interesting. But you do find out uh, quite a lot about your neighbours and their views about things, which <laughs> sometimes are not always completely palatable. But there you are. You take the rough with the smooth. But I wonder, uh, Renee, whether there might be a kind of danger a bit further along the track with companies getting a bit too much into this kind of neighbourliness and trying to tap the moo, creating videos and and all the rest of it, that it could be seen as a bit exploitative of, of the COVID situation? Yeah, I mean, I think brands need to be careful about that and finding the right balance. You know, we did see some examples in China um, where consumers felt that brands were trying to take advantage of the situation, that they were trying to be too commercial during this time and it was too sales driven. Um, so I think there is a potential that even though you're trying to connect with them and trying to do something that makes them feel better during this time, that there could be some potential, um, you know, backlash where people say, you know, you're taking advantage of me during a, a vulnerable time. So I think brands do have to be um, quite careful about that. And I think, you know, uh, just tagging on to what Felicia was saying, you know, I think this is a good opportunity for brands to try some of these new um, media platforms and the way that everyone's consuming media is changing so much during this process. So one you know, interesting thing is that um, mobile usage is down and desktop usage is up, right? So before it was all the trends were that mobile is going completely up and desktop was going away. Now we're seeing now that everyone's home, they're just on a computer. They don't necessarily need to look at everything on their phone. So when you look at, um, and then even looking at things like the, the entertainment sites, right? Everyone's at home watching movies. Can I, can I just say here that the, if you go on a house party on a PC, the games don't work. They only work on the mobile. So that was very yeah, I mean, I think it depends on which one, but I think that, you know, this information, I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, if you, if you like me, you spend half an hour looking for the button and then, and then a five-year-old tells you there isn't one. Yeah, there is a five-year-old in the room, I should add, we are social distancing. But um, yeah, um, sorry, Fel Felicia, I think you were about to say something. Oh, no, I, I didn't. But um, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Renee. Also, interesting, in China, there's been a little bit of a, a takeover of certain uh, media over the others. For example, um, some of the video streaming uh, platforms took over from the cinemas. That was quite easy to do because obviously people cannot go to cinemas, cannot go to the theater. And um, the, the uh, coronavirus broke out during the Chinese New Year, which is uh, the time for blockbusters to come out. So some of these um, video streaming platforms took over and bought the rights for all the uh, big films that were going to screen at that time and so the question is going forward isn't that they're going to be a big issue maybe for these live venues so one media taking over sort of cannibalizing the other um, Another aspect of uh, this, uh, Gabrielle, is of course the, the numbers of Chinese uh, middle class, the rising generation of consumers in China who've looked to coming to Europe. Uh, they love to come to the UK. Obviously, they do shopping uh, here, Mr. Village, many other places too, but particularly there. What do you think might replace, because of course that channel, I mean, it's, it's, it's only going to be a slow return to the, the physical travel. This, of course, goes for us uh, going abroad too. So d do you think digital channels will really replace that business? I mean, it, it's only going to be a proportion of it, isn't it? I don't think they're going to replace it, but I do think that things will be different. So I think that UK brands will need to think more about domestic audiences. Um, and, and that is something, if you look at luxury brands, you know, they tend to follow a, a shopping pattern, particularly, you know, in most countries, we have um, certain times of the year which, where it's more likely that there would be Chinese, um, Chinese shoppers coming to the UK and, and that would be like any other part of, you know, there's a, a more certain times that, um, or more likely times that um, people from EMEA um, audiences would be, would be coming to the UK, but, but companies here will need to think about how they, how they spread that out uh, and how they're gonna be targeting slightly differently uh, some of the European countries are, I mean, and we're all at different stages with the coronavirus right now. It's your idea about planning, doesn't it? This absolutely is the time to actually look at how you used to do things, where customers came from, where the leads were, how they communicated, and actually look at whether some of that could be replaced or, or changed. Because it's kind of easy to get caught in the headlights and not actually do your homework. But just some of the things, too, I think will happen. Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to um, add something quickly to what you said, Gabrielle, because interestingly enough, Mulberry, I think they just announced very recently that they're equalizing their prices everywhere. 
including in China, um, it, because of that. Um, Which was the more expensive market then before, do you know? Um, China, so people would uh, come here in order to shop here, and knowing that this is not possible in the, thank you for pointing that out, and um, as now this is not possible, they um, um, specifically said that prices will now, so the policy is now to have exactly equal prices across the markets, so you can yeah. buy it at the same price. Well, I, th I think Britain's yeah. going the other way, I, I do a bit of shopping on Amazon and eBay, as we all do. And I think the prices are eye-wateringly high. I think something's going on. I mean, I think they'll come down because obviously in the end, you know, market forces will apply. But it is interesting that pricing at the moment is all over the place, maybe for, for reasons that we can understand. Yeah, and one thing I just would add, you know, on top of what Felicia and Gabrielle said, um, you know, Chinese are shopping overseas right now. So you may not see it, um, because they're not physically there, but there's Daigo, which is the overseas purchasing, and that is up hugely during this time. So what we're seeing is Chinese consumers are shopping. Um, they're very savvy. They know the global price everywhere. So as soon as a department store in the U.S. goes on sale, they know, and they're going to be putting in orders, right? So every time they're taking advantage of all, it's already cheaper to buy in the U.S. or in the U.K., um, and then when there's discounting, it's even more cheap. Right. So the Daigo agents are, are coming in the middle and they're really taking advantage of that. And their business is up two and three times what it was last year. So they are buying right now. Actually, they're just not physically traveling. So I think that's something that brands don't always see. It's not always evident because it's coming from a local address on e-commerce, but it is going to China. So I think that that business is increasing right now um, and they, we expect that to continue. OK, well, we've only got uh, two or three minutes to go. So as we sort of try and bring this to a conclusion, let's just go around once while well, starting with Gabrielle, we're sorry, interrupted you a bit earlier. So final thought then on how companies can use this time profitably. I think it's again about spending time to, to plan, but also to think, you know, six months down the line, there are some really interesting things people will be wanting to do. We've talked a lot here about everybody's changing their, you know, um, consumption to be more in, at home. People will want to have milestone trips. People will also want to go back the other way. They may not do it in the same way, but they will want to engage. They will want to go to events of some sort uh, and they will want to, to, to travel again. And, and so how are you going to adapt yourself to telling to, to, to those, that way of behaving, but also so that you're really prepared. So when people are there, that you're one of the compelling things they are going to do opposed to um, you know, other priorities they may have then, but it's, it's thinking a little bit further on down the line if that's possible. And it is hard to do those things at the same time right now when people are so near-term focused. Great thought. And a uh, quick final thought from Felicia and Renee. Felicia. Yeah, so I think there's definitely the practical side of things. So um, fixing your digital setup, that's a, a no-brainer. Integrating technology, I have to do that right now. Then, as I said, also by sector. So what is happening in your sector now and how it's influenced by the virus and, and according to that. And then more long term, basically, as I said, getting prepared for a consumer that is more holistic and that uh, expects a lot more from brand, like a very clear expression of your brand story, of uh, your purpose, of um, how, you know, sustainable you are and green you are, all these new expectations, or not really new, but really reinforced expectations. Great, and Renee? Uh, yeah, I'd say the final message would be really to plan for flexibility, right? So to do as much planning as you can now to get things in order. Um, I think there's gonna be a big repricing of media. I think your benchmarks are gonna change. Influencers are dropping their prices. So I think there's a, a big shakeup in terms of how people are um, consuming information, but to be able to be really flexible um, the governor of California had a saying that I like, uh, Gavin Newsom, he said this uh, turning back on is not going to be a light switch, it's going to be a dimmer, and it's probably going to be going up and down as time goes on, and we might be going through waves. So things are going to have to change, and you have to be willing to try new things, do them small, test things out, and then pull back and start again. So that flexibility is going to be key. Fantastic. Well, it seems a good note to end on. So we've got to reflect on the past, we've got to plan ahead, we've got to stay flexible, and of course stay a positive and uh, I think also show your true colours which means sort of really uh, delving down into what your organisation means and how you can uh, convey that uh, uh, to your customers. Uh, many thanks to uh, Renee uh, Hartman, uh, so Brennan on your thing, I won't go into that now, uh, Felicia Schwartz and Gabrielle Shaw. Um, 
Uh, we, we didn't actually get any questions through to you now, but if you would like to ask anything specific or talk to our participants, then uh, if you don't already have their details, then you can engage through the address where you joined the, uh, uh, join the webinar. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been great to have you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, goodbye and uh, keep safe. Thank you, Nigel.